Good evening class. Tonight I'm going to talk about the following topics. First one is the topic on covalent bonding and the factors affecting covalent character, followed by formal charges and resonance, acidity and basicity of functional groups, intermolecular forces, and finally physical and chemical properties of organic compounds. The following figure shows the ionic character of different bonds. We have covalent bond, polar covalent bond, and ionic bond. Polar covalent bond is an intermediate between nonpolar covalent bond and ionic bond. An ionic bond is formed due to the electrostatic attraction of a metal cation and a non-metal anion. This bond is formed when the metal fully releases its electron and the nonmetal accepts the electron that is released by the metal. Nonpolar covalent bond and polar covalent bond are formed due to the sharing of electrons by the participating atoms. We have discussed about the covalent bonding theories in our previous chapter. Those theories involve valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. A nonpolar covalent bond has an equal sharing of electron, whereas a polar covalent bond has an unequal sharing of electron. That is why, due to the unequal sharing of electron, a dipole is formed. Dipole or two poles. One pole has a partially positive charge and the other pole has a partially negative charge. There are three determinants of bond polarity. First one is due to the electronegativity difference of the participating atoms. Electronegativity is the intrinsic property of an atom to attract electrons to itself in a bond. In the general chemistry class, electronegativity difference is a topic that is commonly discussed as a determinant for covalent character. Let's say for example, in methanol, our carbon is bonded to oxygen. The electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5 whereas carbon has 2.5. The difference in electronegativity is 1.0. It is said that when the electronegativity difference is between 0 but less than 0 0.5, the compound is said to be nonpolar. If it's 0 0.5 but less than or equal to 1.5, then it is said to be polar. And finally, if it is greater than 1.5, then the compound is said to be ionic. But electronegativity difference is not a definitive measure of polarity or non-polarity of your molecule. Another example given here is in the case of methyl lithium. Lithium has an electronegativity of 1, whereas carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. The difference in their electronegativity is 1.5. As a result, methyl lithium is borderline, polar, covalent, and ionic. In the following figures, electrostatic potential maps are shown. These electrostatic potential maps show poor electron density in the neighboring atoms due to the inductive effects of the electronegative atom. So in ele electrostatic potential maps, having a color of red are areas of rich electron density. Electrostatic potential map having a color of blue are areas of low electron density. So low electron density have partially positive whereas high electron density has partially negative. Another determinant for covalent character is dipole moment. Dipole moment is designated by mu, which is equal to the charge of the dipole, Q is the charge of the dipole, multiplied by the internuclear distance. So internuclear distance is a vector quantity. Dipole moment is represented by this arrow, and the arrow of the dipole moment points to the region of high electron density. So in the case of water, the region of high electron density is this one. This one is partially negative. So dipole moment points to this arrow. In the case of methanol, this one is the region of high electron density. And for nitrogen, this one is a region of high electron density. Dipole moment has a unit called Debye. D is for Debye. Ionic compounds have the largest 
value of dipole moment due to the fact that their Q is high. They assume a full positive and full negative charge and the internuclear distance is also relatively far. Nonpolar molecules assume a dipole moment of zero because there is no dipole in nonpolar molecules. Polar molecules also assume a value of dipole moment. For, for instance, you have this molecule which has a dipole moment of 2.33. Methyl chloride or chloromethane has a dipole moment of 1.87. So basically, in chloromethane, we have this structure and the region of high electron density is chlorine due to the electronegativity difference. That's why the arrow of the dipole moment points to the direction of high electron density, which is the chlorine atom. So here is the rule for assessing molecules using dipole moments. The first one is molecules having a net dipole moment are polar. So any value of dipole moment, as long as it is not zero, then the molecule can be polar. Well, except for ionic compounds, because ionic compounds have metal and non-metal as participating atoms. The rule number two is molecules with dipole moments that cancel resulting to a net dipole moment of zero are nonpolar. So even though there are molecules with dipole moments but if their dipole moments cancel, take note that dipole moment is a vector quantity meaning they can cancel if their direction is opposite to each other. So if the dipole moments cancel, then the molecule is nonpolar. So let's have an example for the first determinant for dipole moment. It says here, mole molecules having a net dipole moment are polar. Let's have some examples. We have formaldehyde. Formaldehyde has carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen atoms in it. So in this context, oxygen is a very electronegative atom. And it has non-bonding electrons here, which means that oxygen assumes a partial negative charge because it is a region of high electron density, whereas carbon has a partial positive charge, meaning the direction of the dipole moment points to the direction of oxygen. Let's have another example. We have an amine. Nitrogen is electronegative. Aside from that, it also has a non-bonding electron. This region here is an area of high electron density, meaning dipole moment points to this direction. Let's have another example. We have methanol. In the context of methanol, also oxygen has higher electronegativity and it has two lone pairs, meaning it assumes a region of high electron density, meaning dipole moment also points to this direction. And finally, we have an alkyl halide. We have bromomethane, and of course, bromine is relatively electronegative and it has three lone pairs, meaning dipole moment also points to the direction of bromine. Therefore, these molecules having a net dipole moment are polar. The second rule is that molecules with dipole moments that cancel resulting to a net dipole moment of zero are nonpolar. Okay, let's have, for example, carbon dioxide. Oxygen is an electronegative atom compared to carbon, meaning it assumes a partial negative charge. The direction of the dipole moment is to the direction of high electron density. In this case, it's the oxygen. In the following figure, the directions of dipole moments are opposite each other, which means that there is a cancellation of dipole moment, which results to a total dipole moment or net dipole moment of zero. Take note that vector quantities could cancel. It is like when you are applying a force against the wall, the wall also applies a force equal in magnitude to the force that you apply, which is opposite in direction to the force that you applied. Therefore, the wall does not move. Dipole moment also follows that concept since dipole moment is a vector quantity. Another example is carbon tetrachloride. In carbon tetrachloride, all dipole moments point to the direction of chlorine. Therefore, there is an overall dipole moment of zero due to the cancellation of the dipole moment. 
how about this molecule? So dipole moment points to this direction. And since it is a vector quantity, it has both x and y values. So in this context, this chlorine, it has both an x dimension and a y dimension. So the y dimension points to this, and the x dimension points to this. The y dimension points here, the x dimension points here. In this context, there is a partial cancellation of dipole moment with that of this chlorine. But since it is just a partial cancellation of dipole moment, we still have this dipole moment at the x dimension, meaning this molecule is still polar because the net dipole moment is not zero. Another determinant of covalent character is polarizability. By definition, polarizability is the ease of distortion of the electron cloud of an atom or molecule by an electric field. So suppose this one is your electron cloud before polarization. When an electric field is applied to your molecule or atom, then the molecule is seen to be polarized, meaning it assumes an instantaneous dipole partially negative and partially positive ends. In the context of organic chemistry, polarizability is often observed when there is a disparity in the atomic sizes of the atoms participating in a bond due to the difference of the nuclear interaction of the valence electrons of the participating atoms. Okay, so what does the difference of the nuclear attraction of the valence electrons of the participating atoms? In the previous quiz, I have asked why is hydrofluoric acid a weaker acid than hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid, despite the fact that fluorine is the most electronegative atom? The reason for that is polarizability. In hydrofluoric acid, we have hydrogen and fluorine participating in a bond. So the electrons of hydrogen overlaps with the electrons of fluorine at its 2p orbital and 1s for the hydrogen. Therefore, the valence electrons of fluorine are attracted to the nucleus of the hydrogen and same with the valence electron of the hydrogen is also attracted to the nucleus of the fluorine quite strongly. In the context of hydrochloric acid, while the valence electrons of fluorine is attracted to the nucleus of the hydrogen, it is not the same case with the valence electrons of chlorine due to the distance of the nucleus with that of the valence shell. Therefore, in this context, the valence electrons of hydrogen is not that attracted to the nucleus of chlorine since the nucleus is quite far from, from the valence electrons, more so in the context of hydrobromic acid and hydroiodic acid. So we have, so it is really far from the nucleus. It is said that when there is a difference in the nuclear attraction of the valence electrons of the participating atoms, the bonds tend to be polarizable. The electron cloud is easily distorted and eventually the bond can easily be broken. Polarizability is an extended application of the HSAB theory. HSAB means hard and soft acids and bases theory. This concept is under inorganic chemistry, which you will learn when you take that course. In this theory, metal complexes bonded to soft ligands are said to be polarizable. Polarizability in the context of organic chemistry can be applied in identifying good living groups and bad living groups. Basically, good living groups form very polarizable bonds with carbon, whereas bad living groups form a not-so-polarizable bond with carbon. Another very important topic in organic chemistry is formal charge. Formal charges are only a sort of formalism and do not necessarily mean the actual ionic charge. Formal charge is just a tool to account the electrons, the extra electrons in an atom or molecule. It is used to track where is the electron at one point in time, especially in the context of resonance forms. The formula for formal charge is number of valence electrons in free atoms 
minus the number of valence electrons in bonded atoms or number of valence electrons in free atom minus number of bonding electrons over 2 minus number of non-bonding electrons. I simply, I just simplify this formula with number of valence electrons minus number of bonds and subtracted by the number of non-bonding electrons. So in the context of the given example, we have dimethyl sulfoxide. The formal charge of oxygen here is 6 for the number of valence electrons in the free atom. It has 6 electrons minus the number of bond, which is only 1. This one is 1 bond minus the number of non-bonding electrons. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the overall formal charge for oxygen atom is negative 1. That's why it has a negative sign here. Formal charge for the sulfur atom is number of valence electrons in free atom is also 6. Number of bonds is 1, 2, 3. And number of non-bonding electrons is 2. So overall, the formal charge is positive 1. That's why it has a positive charge here. Formal charge is very important in the context of resonance and resonance forms. By the way, what is resonance? In simpler terms, resonance is the movement of electrons in a conjugated system. And this movement accounts for the stability of the molecule. Okay, what does a conjugated system mean? Conjugated system has an alternating single and double bond. In the context of this one, this one is a conjugated system. And electrons are said to be moving around a conjugated system. Also in the context of benzene, it has an alternating double and single bond. Double, single, double, single, double, single. Molecules having a resonance form are, are said to be stable. So in the context of acetate ion, it has a resonance form of, it has two resonance forms. One is this one, but when this non-bonding electron moves here and pushes this pi electron up, it will assume this other resonance form. This non-bonding electron will become a pi electron or pi bond, and this pi bond becomes a non-bonding electron. In the context of benzene, the resonance form is due to the movement of pi electrons or pi bonds. So when this pi bond moves here, the resulting or the adjacent pi bond also moves. And same with the following pi bonds. Finally, it assumes this other resonance form. In the actual scenario, electrons are always moving to and fro one resonance form to another. Therefore, the actual structure of compounds or molecules with resonance form is what we call a resonance hybrid. It is not one form but the hybrid of all the resonance forms. Let's examine the significance of resonance forms or resonance structures to formal charges. Suppose we have the polyatomic ion sulfate. Sulfate has this structure. The formal charge of oxygen 1, oxygen 2, oxygen 3, and oxygen 4 can be calculated. So if you calculate using the formula, the formal charge of oxygen 1 is negative 1. Oxygen 2 is 0. Oxygen 3 is 0. Oxygen 4 is negative 1. Meaning the extra electrons are in oxygens 1 and 4. But when these extra electrons or non-bonding electrons move around the molecule, suppose this one moves here, it pushes the pi electron or the pi bond to the direction of oxygen number 2 thereby forming this resonance form. In this context, oxygen 1 now has zero formal charge. Oxygen 2 now has negative 1 formal charge. Oxygen 3 has zero formal charge. And oxygen 4 has negative 1 formal charge. The extra electron from oxygen 1 now moves to the oxygen number 2. Furthermore, the extra electron from oxygen number 4 can also move here, pushing the pi electron towards oxygen 3 as well, therefore forming another resonance form. So calculating the, the formal charges of each atom, we have 0, 0, negative 1, and negative 1. At this juncture, the extra electrons are at 
oxygen number two and oxygen number three. And finally, we can also move the extra electron of oxygen number two to push back this electron from oxygen from this bond to oxygen number one, thereby assuming another resonance structure, which looks like this. In this context, again calculating the formal charges, we have negative one at oxygen number one, zero at oxygen number two, negative one at oxygen number three, and zero at oxygen number four. And finally, the oxygen or the non-bonding electron from oxygen number three can move back here, thereby pushing this pi electron back to oxygen number four and assuming the original resonance structure that we have written. So the overall charge of the molecule is the net formal charge of the molecule. So in this context, we have negative one plus negative one. Therefore, the overall charge is negative two. The actual form or the actual structure of sulfate ion is a hybrid of all these resonance forms due to the fact that the electrons in sulfate ion are always moving from one resonance form to another. Okay, let's have some more examples for resonance structures. In the context of organic chemistry, there are instances when carbon assumes a positive charge. In that instance, the carbon has a formal charge of positive one. So the carbon is called carbocation. This one is also a conjugated system. And since it is a conjugated system, the pi electron from this carbons 2 and 3 can also move to carbon 1, thereby forming another resonance form. Okay, now it is now the carbon 3 that assumes a formal charge of positive 1 and becomes a carbocation. This pi electron can again move, move back to carbon number 3 carbons 2 and 3 to form a pi bond and it assumes back to its original form that I have written here. Okay, how about in the context of carbon ion? Carbon ions are carbon atoms having a negative charge. So the formal charge is negative 1 and this one is called carbon ion. So this carbon 1, carbon 2, and carbon 3. The resonance form, this one is a conjugated system again as it has an alternating double and single bond and an extra electron that can be delocalized or that can, be, that can move within this conjugated system. So this one can move here, pushing this one here. This non-bonding electron will then become a pi electron or a pi bond and this pi bond will become a non-bonding electron. Carbon 1 will now assume a formal charge of 0. And carbon 3 will now assume a formal charge of negative 1. This one can move back. And you will form this original resonance structure that I have written. Okay, so how about in the context of radicals? Radicals are unpaired electrons. Okay, suppose we have this example. We have a radical here in carbon 1, carbon 2, and carbon 3. So the movement of radical in a conjugated system is shown via a fish hook arrow. A fish hook arrow signifies movement of only one electron. So a fish hook arrow will also attract another, a radical will also attract another unpaired electron. And this one will separate. Take note that in a pi bond, there are two electrons involved. So in this context, one of the electron will pair with the radical and the other electron will be another radical. So in this case, we have... Okay, this one can move back, actually, and will form the original resonance form that I have shown earlier. How about in functional groups? Are resonance forms present in functional groups? Let's see. Okay, suppose we have this structure. This one is a carbonyl, carbonyl group, carbon double bond oxygen, a terminal carbonyl which forms a functional group called aldehyde. So carbon here has two extra electrons and the formal charge is negative one. So this electron is also part of a conjugated system 
because it has an alternating single and double bond. So this one can move here, pushing this pi electron up and forming a double bond. And this pi electron will become a non-bonding electron. So calculating the formal charge of oxygen, we can calculate that it is negative 1. This one can move back and push the resulting pi electrons or pi bond back to carbon, forming back the original resonance form that I have written. Okay, another example given is a nitrile. And this one is also an alternating single and triple bond. So this one is again a conjugated system. It's not only a single and double bond, but it can also be single and triple bond. Okay. This one can move here, pushing this pi electron here, and thereby forming this resonance form. And nitrogen would assume a formal charge of negative 1. Rules in writing resonance forms. The rule number 1 is that Individual resonance forms are imaginary and not real. The real structure is the composite or the resonance hybrid. In a conjugated system, there can be many resonance forms, and electrons are always moving from one resonance form to another resonance form. Therefore, we cannot really say that the structure of one conjugated system or conjugated molecule is this resonance form due to the fact that the bonds can be rearranged. Therefore, the resonance hybrid is, is a real structure of the conjugated molecule. An example of that would be benzene. Benzene has two resonance forms. And the actual structure of benzene is written as this one, meaning the electrons, the pi electrons in a benzene are moving continuously. Rule number two, resonance forms differ only in the placement of pi and non-bonding electrons. We are not concerned with the sigma electrons here, or sigma bonds. So as you can see here, this one is a non-bonding electron, which is moved here, and this one is a pi electron, which is moved here. As a result, the non-bonding electron becomes a pi electron, or pi bond, and the pi bond, or the pi electron, becomes a non-bonding electron. Rule number three, different resonance forms of a substance don't have to be equivalent. A very good example of this is this carbon ion and this alkoxide ion or enolate ion. So in this context, we have C minus. This one is called carbon ion. And this one is O minus. And this one is called alkoxide ion. So this resonance form has a negative charge on the carbon and this resonance form has a negative on the oxygen. So essentially these two resonance forms are not equivalent. Finally, resonance forms obey normal valence, meaning if you move one non-bonding electron or pi electron, you must also move the other non-bonding electron or pi electron in order to obey the normal valency. Because if you do not move this one, you will form this structure and in this structure you have a carbon that has five bonds which is not possible. Finally, the resonance hybrid is more stable than any individual resonance form. Take note that compounds having many resonance forms are said to be stable because resonance structure accounts for the stability of the compound. Drawing resonance forms for the carbonate ion example of the resonance forms given here are the following. So the non-body electron is moved here, pushing this pi electron to form this other resonance form. So now this oxygen bears a negative charge or a negative formal charge, negative 1. This oxygen bears a formal charge of negative 1. That's why it has a negative sign. Furthermore, this lone pair or this non-bonding electrons can move here pushing this pi electron to this oxygen and finally forms this resonance form. In this context, 
in this form, the extra electron is at this oxygen. This movement of electrons happen very fast and these resonance forms can be interchangeable. So the actual structure of carbonate ion is a composite of these resonance forms or is a hybrid of these resonance forms. An example given here is a pentadienyl radical. The example I've given before is when you have a radical subject to a conjugated system, you will use a fish hook arrow in order to signify that only one electron is moved. And this fish hook arrow will also attract another electron from the pi bond and the two electrons from this pi bond part away this uh, another electron will move to the central carbon this one and the resonance form that is resulted from it is this one this one can also move further to this uh, to this part but it is still equivalent to this structure okay so here are the three resonance forms of the pentadienyl radical this one moved here, forming this structure, and this one further moves here, forming this structure. Okay, so which of the following pairs of structures are resonance forms? We have this one and this one. So what happened in this context? We have this pi electron moving moving here and finally moving here to open this bond so what is involved here is breaking of a this one is a sigma bond so these two are not resonance forms the context of b we have this structure and this structure what happened here is movement of non-bonding electron and pi electron so upon moving this non-bonding electron here, we have this resonance form. And when this one moves, once again, pushing this one above, you form the other structure. This one. So these two are resonance forms. In C, what happened here is that this one moves in a conjugated system, pushing this pi electron here thereby forming this resonance form this one can also move back here and pushing this pi electron to this oxygen atom and form the original resonance form that is written here how about this two letter d we have this this and this are they the same resonance form or are they resonance forms the answer is yes so basically this one and this one is just the same and this is a continuation of this so what happens here is that this one moves further to form this structure so basically this and this are still resonance forms okay let's answer some questions in 2.34 okay draw the resonance structures as you can for the following species this one is relatively easy move it here move this one here and you will have another resonance form which looks like this one formal charge is negative one and you have a double bond here ch2 in the case of c you also have this one moves here to form and this one can still move its non bonding electron to form another resonance form, which looks like this. Okay, let's talk about acids and bases. In general chemistry, you were taught about the different definitions of acids and bases. We have our heinous acids and bases, we have the bronze and lowry definition, and Finally, the Lewis definition. In the context of organic chemistry, we are more concerned about the bronsted lowry definition. According to bronsted lowry definition, a bronsted acid is a hydrogen ion donor and a bronsted base is a hydrogen ion acceptor. So the example given above is hydrochloric acid and water. 
to form chloride and hydronium ion. So what happens here is hydrochloric acid gives its hydrogen ion to water for thereby forming a hydronium ion. So in Bronsted Law redefinition, we have terms like acid, base, conjugate base, and conjugate acid. The most common representation of an acid-base reaction based on Bronsted Law redefinition is this one. Your acid is designated as HA and base is designated with B with the lone pair. So the base removes the hydrogen of the acid, thereby forming a conjugate base and the conjugate acid. Examples are acetic acid and hydroxide ion. So in this context, hydroxide ion removes the hydrogen or accepts the hydrogen of acetic acid, forming a conjugate base called acetate and conjugate acid, which is water. Another example given here is ammonia, which serves as a base. And ammonia accepts the hydrogen of your water to form hydroxide ion and ammonium ion. But this reaction is actually not thermodynamically favored. The favored reaction is the opposite reaction. That is why the reverse reaction is written as, or the reverse arrow is written as a bold arrow. Let's have some more examples. Suppose you have acetic acid which reacts with your sulfuric acid to form protonated acetic acid and this anion. In this context, sulfuric acid acts as your acid and acetic acid acts as your base or bronze and base. This one is your conjugate acid and this one is your conjugate base. Another example given is carbonate ion with water to form bicarbonate ion and hydroxide. Okay, so in this context, carbonate ion acts as your base and water acts as your acid since it is the one that gives off hydrogen and this one is your conjugate acid and this one is your conjugate base. Okay, suppose we have the following reaction. Okay, what happens here is that your carbon ion deprotonates the hydrogen of your ammonia to form an alkane, which is called an ethane, and forming this amide anion. So in this context, your base is the carbon ion. Acid is your ammonia. Conjugate acid is your ethane. And conjugate base is amide anion. Okay, so in the context of bronsted lowry definition, the strength of organic acids can be measured based on their pKa value. We have seven strong acids, and those are hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, and chloric. Apart from those strong acids, all other acids are weak acids. But among the weak acids, how can we classify whether this weak acid is stronger than another weak acid? The answer is by identifying their pKa values. Ka is called the acid dissociation constant, and the larger the value of your Ka, the stronger your acid could be. In the case of pKa, pKa is the negative logarithm of your Ka. For pKa values, the lower the pKa value, the stronger your acid could be. The higher the pKa value, the weaker your acid could be. We have here hydrochloric acid. So the hydrogen of hydrochloric acid is polarizable and is very acidic. And the pKa value is negative 7. We also have nitric acid. The pKa value is negative 1.3. Phosphoric acid, the first ionization of phosphoric acid has a pKa of 2.16. Acetic acid, 4.76. The hydrogen phosphate ion or the second ionization of Phosphoric acid has a pKa of 7.21. Hydrocyanic acid, this one has, this hydrogen has a pKa of 9.31 and water has a pKa of 15.74 when factors such as autoionization are accounted for. Ethanol has a P, this hydrogen of ethanol, being an acid, has a pKa of 16. Comparing the pKa values, you could say that ethanol is 
weaker acid than nitric acid and water is weaker acid than acetic acid. Another trend to be noted is that the weaker the acid, the stronger is its conjugate base. So the conjugate base of ethanol is ethoxide or just remove the hydrogen and con just remove the hydrogen and replace it with a negative sign. Water is hydroxide, just remove the hydrogen. Hydrogen cyanide or hydrocyanic acid is cyanide. Remove the hydrogen and replace it with negative charge. Hydrochloric acid has chloride as its conjugate base. So there is an inverse relationship between the strength of the acid and strength of the conjugate base. The stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base could become. And the weaker the acid, the stronger its conjugate base could become. So therefore, even though ethanol is a weak acid and hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, chloride ion is a weaker base compared to ethoxide ion. Also, acetate ion is a weaker conjugate base compared to hydroxide ion. Some examples given here are methanol having a pKa of 15.54, acetic acid 4.76, meaning acetic acid is more acidic than methanol. These hydrogens of acetone have a pKa of 19.3, meaning it is even less acidic than this hydrogen of methanol. And these ones are their conjugate bases. We have methoxide, acetate, a carbon ion form of your enolate. Okay, what affects the strength of conjugate bases? The main factor that affects the strength of conjugate base is resonance. Suppose you have this methoxide ion as a conjugate base of methanol. So this one has no resonance form whatsoever. But in the context of acetic acid, its conjugate base is acetate ion. And this one can have a resonance form of this one. This one can move forming another resonance form. So therefore, in this context, the conjugate base of acetic acid, which is acetate, is even less basic. Suppose we have acetone. Upon the protonation of acetone, you will form this carbon ion, which is its conjugate base. And this carbon ion can have a resonance form of this. This one is called enolate. So these two have resonance forms. That's why the resulting conjugate base are not that strong. Some other examples of bronzed lowry acids and bronzed lowry bases are given here. You have acetic acid, pyruvic acid, and citric acid. If you want a comprehensive list of pKa in order to assess the strength of acids or functional groups, please refer to Evans' pKa table. We have here inorganic acids values for the hydrogen of inorganic acid. Okay, suppose you have sulfurous acid. The first ionization of sulfurous acid has a pKa of 1.9 and the second ionization has a pKa of 7.21. We have alcohols here. Suppose you have methanol. This hydrogen of methanol has a pKa of 15.5. You can find some more functional groups in Evans' pKa table. Here is a list of pKa values of functional groups. You have alkane. The pKa of alkane is 50 or above. Alkene has a pKa of 43. Hydrogen gas has a pKa of 36. Amine has a pKa of 35. Sulfoxide, this hydrogen of sulfoxide, has a pKa of 31. This hydrogen of alkyne has a pKa of 25. This hydrogen of ester has a pKa of 25 and this hydrogen of nitrile also has a pKa of 25. So these are all very weak acids. And since they are very weak acids, they form very, very strong base. The conjugate base of alkane is a carbon ion, which is a very strong base. Also alkene, hydrogen has hydride as its conjugate base. Amine or ammonia has amide ion as a conjugate base and so on and so forth. We also have aldehydes, ketones, alcohol, water, malonates, thiols, protonated amines, and carboxylic acids. 
with all their PKA values. Finally, we get to the part where we can examine the PKA values of strong acids. So we have hydronium ion PKA of negative 1.7, sulfuric acid negative, th negative 3, hydrochloric acid is negative 6, hydrobromic acid is negative 9, and hydroiodic acid is negative 10. Basically, hydroiodic acid is also a very strong acid. So if you compare the PKA values, you can assess whether or not the following compound or molecule is more acidic or less acidic than the other. For instance, if we compare water with thiols, thiols are more acidic than water. If we compare water with alkanes, of course, water is more acidic than alkanes. But if you compare their, the strength of their conjugate base, carbon ion of alkanes are very strong bases compared to iodide. So iodide is the weakest base they're in, weakest bronze base. Water as a base is a weaker base compared to fluoride. So fluoride is relatively stronger base than water. Also ammonia is a stronger base than acetate, but a weaker base than hydroxide. Also, hydroxide is a weaker base than alkoxide, or in this context, methoxide. So all these factors can be investigated by looking at the pKa values of functional groups. So here are the organic bases. We have examples are methylamine, methanol, acetone, um, alanine, etc. Okay, so let's answer some exercise given here. Nitric acid reacts with ammonia to yield ammonium nitrate. Write the reaction and identify the acid base conjugate acid and conjugate base product. This one reacts with ammonia to form, well, of course, ammonium plus nitrate. Basically, this one is your acid, this one is your base, this one is your conjugate acid, and this one is your conjugate base. So what happened here is that this nitrogen or uh, ammonia deprotonated nitric acid to form ammonium and assuming a formal charge of positive one. This one forms it forms a nitrate anion as its conjugate base. Okay. Let's answer some more examples here. The amino acid phenylalanine has a pKa of 1.83. Tryptophan has 2.83. What is a stronger acid? Of course, the stronger acid is the one that has lower pKa. So basically, phenylalanine is the stronger acid. Okay, we have problem 2.13 here. Amide ion is a, is a much stronger base than hydroxide ion. Which is the stronger acid, ammonia or water? So it says here, ammonia, amide, water, hydroxide. So it says here, amide is a very strong base. This one is a weak base. Meaning, if you have a weaker conjugate base, you have a stronger acid. And if you have a stronger conjugate base, you have a weaker acid. So it, simple as that. The stronger acid then is water, and the weaker acid is ammonia. Okay, we have uh, some examples here. Okay, let's get to the part where we can predict acid-base reactions from pKa values. Okay, so in this context, we have acetic acid reacted with hydroxide ion to form acetate ion and water. So identifying their pKa values, we can say that this one is a stronger acid and this one is a weaker acid. Okay, so... Acetic acid reacts with acet hydroxide ion to form acetate ion and water. This reaction proceeds completely. This reaction is possible. It's because stronger acid can form weaker acid, weaker conjugate acids, but not the other way around. Let's have this example. Okay, water has a pKa of 15.74 and acetylene is 25. So pKa is 25. And water is 15.7. Just by looking at it, this one is a weaker acid and this one is a stronger acid. 
So is it possible for the question here is does the reaction proceed? Is it possible to deprotonate this one to form this conjugate base? By the way, this conjugate base is a very strong conjugate base. In this context, this reaction is not possible because you cannot form strong acids from weak acids. And you and also you cannot form strong bases from weak bases. Will either of the following reactions take place to a significant extent as written according to the data in the table? Let's examine the following. Hydrocyanic acid has a pKa of around 8 or 9. And acetic acid has a pKa of 4.79, 4.76. So basically, you have weaker acid to produce a stronger acid. Okay, so basically this one does not occur. How about the other way around? You have stronger acid and you have weaker acid. Okay, this one occurs. Okay, let's have another example here. Ammonia has a pKa of 36 and acetone has a pKa of 19. Meaning acetone is a stronger acid and ammonia is a weaker acid. Will sodium amide be able to deprotonate this hydrogen? The answer is yes. A sodium amide is a very strong base and this one is also a strong base and it produces a weak base. So basically, strong acids produce weak acid and strong base can produce weak bases but not the other way around. So this reaction is possible or it occurs. Okay, let's have some more examples. Okay, let's examine the pKa values. This one has a pKa of 38 and this one has a pKa of 50. So in this context, this one is your base and this one is your acid. This one is your conjugate acid. This one is your conjugate base. So what we have here, your acid is a strong acid and the acid here, the conjugate acid is a weak acid. Our conjugate base here is a very strong conjugate base. It's a very strong base and the conjugate base here is relatively weak compared to this one. So this reaction occurs. This reaction proceeds completely. Okay, how about you have you have methoxide and water to form hydroxide and methanol. Okay, the pKa of water is 15.7 and the pKa of methanol is 15.5. So in this context, since the pKa values are very near, meaning the strength is relatively the same. So if the strength is relatively the same, the reaction can go both ways can be irreversible. So this reaction proceeds partially. Take note that if the difference in the pKa value is around plus minus 5 pKa units, the reaction may be able to proceed partially or it can be in equilibrium. So the reverse reaction can also happen. This one removes this to form methoxide and water. And this one also removes the hydrogen of water to form hydroxide. Okay, let's get to the concept about Lewis acids and bases. According to Lewis' definition of acids and bases, Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors, whereas Lewis bases are what they call electron pair donors. So as long as you have an electron pair which you can donate, meaning you can be an, you can be a Lewis base. And as long as you can accept electron pair, meaning you can be a Lewis acid. Okay. In the context of organic chemistry, Lewis acids are called electrophiles or electron-loving species. Whereas Lewis base are called nucleophiles. A very good example of a Lewis base and a Lewis acid is the following. We have dimethyl ether and the oxygen of dimethyl ether has non-bonding electrons. These non-bonding electrons can be donated to boron. Take note that boron has a vacant orbital. So the hybridization of boron is sp2. So what? Boron 
looks like this 2s 2p so when it hybridizes it forms sp2 3 sp2 hybrid orbitals and one vacant p orbital so it has an empty orbital to be filled that is when the lone pair or the electron pair of your dimethyl ether can be donated to boron to this orbital to form this acid base complex the examples of lewis acids are we have water hydrobromic acid nitric acid sulfuric acid so basically all lewis acids have partial positive charges or full positive charges so in this context you have partial positive partial positive partial positive and this one is full positive full positive and this one has three plus four plus three plus and two plus the cations are also lewis acids and metal compounds are also lewis acids okay, examples of lewis bases are all compounds having electron pair that can be donated examples are alcohol ether electron pairs of aldehydes and ketones acid chloride carboxylic acid ester amide amine sulfide this some um, triphosphate ion and some other lewis bases so basically lewis bases are everything that has partially negative charges or full negative charges Okay, so let's look at this example. You have acetic acid, which is protonated by sulfuric acid. So what happens here is that this one is donates its electron to this hydrogen and it accepts this electron here. So basically, this one is a Lewis base and also a Bronsted base at the same time. So that one can also occur. Apart from being a bronsted base, it can also be a bronsted acid. But in this context, it serves or it acts as a Lewis base and bronsted base. So what happens is you have this structure which has a resonance form of this other structure. Using curved arrows show how the species in part A can act as Lewis bases in their reactions with hydrochloric acid and how the species in part B can act as Lewis acids in their reactions with hydroxides. Actually, it's relatively easy. Part A react with hydrochloric acid. What we have there is ethanol, dimethylamine, and trimethylphosphine. Ethanol, dimethylamine, and triphenylphosphine. And in their reaction with hydrochloric acid. So what happens here, ethanol first, we have hydrochloric acid form protonated ethanol and in this case the formal charge is positive one so in this context your ethanol served as both a bronsted base and a lewis base and this one is your conjugate acid and this one is your conjugate base okay we have second example is trimethylamine and dimethylamine with ethanol hydrochloric acid basically you form an ammonium type of conjugate acid and chloride so your this one is your bronsted base or lewis base this one is your acid bronsted acid or lewis acid and this one is your conjugate acid and conjugate base Reacted with hydrochloric acid, you have the same scenario. And trimethylphosphine pala. Same case. This one is your bronsted base or Lewis base. And this one is your bronsted acid and Lewis acid. Conjugate acid. Conjugate acid and conjugate base. 